Hello. Thank you all for coming out to this off-road conversation. My name is Brandon Zeck. I'm the publisher of Glass Tire. Uh, just in case any of you don't know what Glass Tire is, Glass Tire is an online publication that covers visual art in Texas. We're a nonprofit. We were founded in 2001, uh, and we do everything from publish podcasts to videos to news to reviews to classifieds to event listings. Basically, if it's art in Texas, we do that. Uh, so we can be your source for all of that. If you've never visited our website, I invite you to visit our website. If you uh, haven't looked at our website in a little while, I invite you to come back. I bet you will find something that you appreciate and enjoy. Uh, a little bit of housekeeping before we get fully kicked off. Uh, I would like to thank all of our sponsors that made today happen. Uh, the Texas Commission on the Arts, the Houston Arts Alliance for helping make this talk uh, a reality. To all of our underwriters also, uh, we greatly thank you. We are a nonprofit, so every little bit helps. Thank you also to Carol Piper Ruggs in Sunset Settings for this beautiful stage set. Uh, yes. <laughs> And uh, thank you to Masterword Services, who are providing live uh, sign language ASL interpretation for this conversation. And also, yes. <laughs> and they will also be uh, subtitling the video of this conversation in Spanish. So Glass Tire has a new initiative to publish articles and videos and podcasts and all of our content uh, in two languages, in English and in Spanish. So this is part of that initiative and we're very excited to be able to open this conversation to more ears and more eyes. Thank you also to Brazos Bookstore. They are selling John Keane's uh, book, Counter Narratives, out in the lobby. If you haven't ever read it, I highly suggest you pick it up. There will be a book signing following the talk with John. John is delightful. Please go pick up a copy of his book and say hi. Um, and uh, thank you to our board of directors. Um, I have to thank them because being on the board of a nonprofit is a labor of love, and we can't do anything that we do without their support. And also to our staff. Our staff is a crucial part of what we do. Um, our staff is tasked with covering all of Texas. We are a statewide publication, so it's only, uh, it's only once you start driving across Texas for your job that you realize how big Texas truly is. So thank you to them, our editorial team, Christina Reese and Christopher Blay, uh, our admin team, Mackenzie Watson and Jennifer Battaglia, and our other staffers, our programmer, Seth Mittag, and our social media editor, William Saradet. We love you, and you're what are the, t you are the tires of Glass Tire. Uh, a big thank you also for helping me make this talk possible. Roberto Tejada, Veronica Roberts, and Emily Todd, uh, all three of you, you know what you did. Uh, you're fantastic, and we appreciate you at Glass Tire. Um, I'm not going to give John and Vincent a big bio or introduction because I feel like some of you, some of you may know their work, you may not. Um, if you don't, you're about to learn a lot about their ideas and what they do. Um, Vincent Valdez lives here in Houston. He was born in San Antonio. And if you've been around Texas at all, you might have seen his art somewhere. He's in many collections. He shows here in Houston, San Antonio, Austin, uh, many other places too. And uh, what drew me to Vincent's work is the fact that he uh, explores the unaddressed narratives of American history. And what Vincent does with pictures and with images, John Keane truly does with words. And Roberto Tejada introduced me to, jo uh, to John Keane's writing. And uh, the second that I read the first chapter of his book, I realized that he and Vincent would be the perfect match for this conversation. So that's it from me. Uh, and please give it up. Thank you. We're so glad you're here. Give it up for Vincent Valdez and John Keane. walked out to some, some real fanfare. Yeah. <laughs> All right. thank, thank you for being here. Uh, I, I think we'd like to start off by saying thank you to Glass Tire, to 
to all of the sponsors for this event and to all of you for choosing to be here and, instead of a Astros party tonight. Um, <laughs> but most of all, thank you to this man right here for being a part of uh, today's event. It's really an honor to share ideas and words and a stage with you. Um, do you recall the very last subject that we spoke about last night after dinner? Well, there were, there were so many, <laughs> so I, I don't remember the, the very last one. It was, uh, we were sharing and comparing traumatic flight turbulence stories. Oh, yes. And you seeped into my consciousness because I woke up at 5.01 a.m. this morning in a cold sweat <laughs> because I remembered my most traumatic story that I thought I'd, I, I had to share with you. Uh, it was somewhat recent. Um, it was even more traumatic than the last one I shared with you last night. And me and my fiance were headed to San Francisco, and uh, we, were, we, we couldn't sit next to each other. I don't do so well with flying. And the announcement came on to brace yourself because we were going to hit some crazy turbulence. Now, when, when I saw the stewardesses running oh, yes, down the yes. aisle, I thought, oh, shit, <laughs> like this is serious. <laughs> and so this machine was just dropping out of the sky. And you described it well. It's just, it was making airplanes when they make sounds like they're about to be ripped apart. And I thought, this is it. We're going down. Uh, I was losing it, and this woman next to me, maybe about mid-70s, was on her iPad, and I just kept looking at her like, you know, I was so tempted to just grab her hand or hold onto her arm, and she was just on this iPad, and I thought, well, is, this, is it me? Like, is it, is, am I the only one panicking here? And uh, it got worse and worse, and I thought, wow, th this is really bad. And then I remember glancing over her, for a second, and I thought, you know, maybe this woman has the right idea. Mm -hmm. Maybe, just maybe it's gonna all work out and be okay. Maybe if you just stay calm uh, and follow her lead, like, and it sort of turned into this bigger symbol, like maybe even beyond this turbulence, maybe that's the way to behave. So we finally land, got out of it, and she finally leans over to me, stayed glued to that iPad the entire time, and she was playing this game on it. And she looked at me and she said, are you okay, honey? You poor thing, I saw your knees shaking. You seemed like you were in bad shape. And I said, you know, I just gotta ask you, why didn't you do anything? Why didn't you scream? Why didn't you like say something? And she looked me dead in the eye and said, well, you know, I thought if we crash, I might as well try to beat my, my high score before we go down. <laughs> and I thought, okay, so it turns out you were just crazy, right? <laughs> <laughs> but on that note. <laughs> <laughs> well, first let me just start off by saying it's an incredible honor to be here on stage you, with you. Uh, and uh, it was a joy to actually immerse myself in your work and learn about you. And then, of course, to have a conversation with you last night and then today in your studio to see your work. So I hope we get a chance to talk about uh, some of the projects that you're doing, that you've done, that you're doing. But so not to re-traumatize you, so I'm not gonna tell the story of, <laughs> you know, uh, my flight nightmare. Although I will say, uh, if you are flying between Seattle and Missoula, brace yourself, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> um, but to, to, to sort of move to, to positive memories, you know, I was thinking about uh, your uh, movement between drawing and painting. And so often, uh, I think it's fair to say visual artists begin uh, with drawing. So would you talk a little bit about you know, how you began to draw, when you, when you began to draw, and uh, how um, you, know, you moved into this as a, as a career? And of course, you can, you're gonna, I'm sure, I hope, I hope you will share with the audience about your love of music sure. um, and how that plays into uh, your, your art making. So according to my mom and dad, I was drawing before I was walking mm -hmm. and talking. It was really my first language, um, my way of communicating to the world. And, uh, but it, it came so natural that I didn't have to really think about it. And I thought it was so natural and ordinary for me that I assumed by the time I got to kindergarten that everybody could draw because it was so easy. And then I started realizing very slowly by the end of that first year that um, my Superman actually looked like a person 
as opposed to stick figures. Um, and then by, you know, I started advancing really quickly, uh, and I was so hungry for it. I, it just, it was something that I was so obsessed with at a very early age. I never really questioned it or had to like examine it from a third person perspective. Like I, I, it just, it was, it was completely normal to me. But it wasn't until, as far as a you know, a career choosing to go down this path, it wasn't until, or it was as early as like fourth and fifth grade that I started figuring out, ah, oh, like I can sell these drawings for 50 cents, you know, <laughs> lunch money. Um, by the time I was in seventh grade, I had progressed to a dollar. Um, but it really, it's, it's always been a part, uh, an extension of me. And I and I'd really even go further to say that um, you know, I always say, if I could only speak as well as I could draw with a pencil, life would be easy, right? <laughs> uh, how, how about you? Like, as, as far as, um, you know, in the, in the reading that I've done about your background uh, in history and the work and the material that you've produced uh, creatively and put out into the world, and I have a lot of questions for you. And, and I've always been fascinated with writers and the ability to articulate ideas so clearly and so eloquently the way you do with words, right? It's really, um, it's really something that I have always thought like that is a struggle for me. And so one of the things that I recognize very quickly in reading um, counter narratives is the way that you construct these ideas and use words. I mean, you know how to, you know how to write like a poet, but you know how to throw a left hook like a southpaw, right? And, and that's something that I think is really, uh, really unique. Um, so when did it all kind of start for you? Well, it's fascinating that you mentioned that your mother uh, reminded you of when you first started drawing. My mother always tells me that at 18 months old, I started drawing um, before I could really speak uh, or do anything else or walk. Right? Uh, and then at a certain point, I think, I, I don't know, something kicked in, and I'm a very shy person, but I, I'm also like, a, you know, I always got in trouble in school for talking too much, right? You know? <laughs> and half the time, the teacher would be trying to teach, and I'd want to be teaching alongside the teacher, which is probably why I'm a professor. Um, <laughs> but I would, my mother, my mother would have me in the shopping cart, and I'd be, we'd be going through the, um, you know, going to the supermarket, and I'd be reciting the Pledge of Allegiance or, you know, something I saw on TV uh, or something I, you know, when I, you know, just something I'd heard. And uh, people would say to her, you know, how old is this child, you know? Right. This was an interesting little child. And then we, we actually went out to California when I was five. And um, my uncle, my mother was pregnant with my younger brother, and my uncle had all these Dr. Seuss books because he had a son who was a few years younger than me. And my parents were you know, doing the things that parents do with you know, my aunt and uncle and hanging out. And I would go in the room and I guess pick up these Dr. Seuss books and read them. And so then at one, one evening, I came out you know, of the room with one of the books and just opened it up. And my, my mother had read to me and my father had, had read to me. And I started reading from this book. And so they said, oh my God, you know, he can read, you know, they, got, wow, you know, they had no yeah. idea. So I, it was a short trip from that to writing and drawing. And uh, when I was in junior high, well, grade school, junior high, high school, I wrote poems. I mean, some of these things I don't even remember, but you know, my mother would, now she'll, she'll tell me, oh yeah, you had these little books she would make and you, know, draw, you would often do the drawings for the books. And it's something I just have always felt very drawn to. I also have to say, you know, I loved to read. You know, um, I'm, I'm I should say, I love to read. I'm not one of those people who stopped <laughs> reading, right? Uh, I do still read. Um, but I, as a child, I loved to read, and I would read anything I could get my hands on. And at a certain point, I think I, I realized, okay, you know, someone has to write these books. So, what if I tried to write a book? And I think maybe in high school, I was, you know, I had a good friend, um, 
and we were reading, uh, I think it was James, you know, this impossible book, James Joyce's Ulysses, right? And we raced each other to write, to, to read the book. But what he didn't realize was that as we were racing each other to get through this book, um, which was not anything, you know, high school students should be reading, um, I was writing and basically imagining I was writing my own Ulysses, which is just, I mean, it was, I, I don't even know wow. why that stuff is. But that was really kind of the start. And then from college and then thereafter, I've, uh, I've pursued it. Um, and the, I still, as I was mentioning you, I still draw, but you know, I have incredible uh, appreciation for people who make, uh, who have made visual art, you know, kind of the focus of their, of their practice, visual art, you know, uh, in all its forms. Because I think it's really, drawing is, you know, being able to represent the world, uh, drawing and painting, some of the, you know, supreme achievements. Do you find a lot of similarities between writing and drawing? Well, I do, because I often think, you know, it, there's, this, there's a fascinating way in which I sometimes think, particularly with poetry, that, uh, that you know, that it does not depend upon, like, there's this idea that, you know, we often think uh, that everything, the, the human beings function logically and everything depends on logic. And of course, you, you know, if you're in a courtroom, you want people who understand how you know the law works and to think logically, et cetera. If you're dealing with you know uh, engin- you know someone who's building a bridge, you know you right. want them to be able to understand the mathematics of building a bridge and you know the, all of the physical you know, physical laws, et cetera. But you know when you are drawing, when you are uh, you know writing poetry, and, and I would say it also is it, it's any kind of literature, especially poetry, but also fiction. Um, uh, playwriting, sometimes screenwriting, etc. And this also sort of extends to all the arts, right? It requires something other than logic, right? It, require, or a kind of, it requires a kind of dream logic, right? It requires an ability to kind of see um, in, in multiple ways, right? See with depth and with breadth and to, to take yourself, as we were saying, you know, once you get into, I um, was saying earlier, uh, once you really sort of get into the work you step almost outside yourself. Right. And it's not a logical process. Right. right. And so in that regard, you know, I do see this deep connection. And I also see, I mean, I, I find myself often very, uh, not just moved, but inspired by visual art. Well, you, you know, I, I did something or somewhat similar in terms of, like, the way that I really learned to draw, I credit... Um, the television screen. Mm-hmm. So what I would do was, um, you know, at that time, VCRs had just come out on the market and they were about this big, right? And weighed about 80 pounds. And, uh, and I remember we would, my, I would ask my, mo- my mother to put in uh, VHS tapes of like Superman with Christopher Reeve was obsessed with that movie, mm-hmm. and I would have her pause it, and then I would run and get a sheet of tracing paper, oh. and I would trace from the screen, mm-hmm. and that's really how I learned anatomy, how to draw the figure, facial expression, but that's why there's such a cinematic quality that still remains this day in my work. Mm-hmm. But what I would do is I would take um, all my favorite comic books, mm-hmm. and I would flip through these pages, and I'd say, no, these images aren't good enough, these drawings aren't good enough, and, uh, and so I would cut out the actual images, take out the text bubbles and redraw the comic characters because I was convinced that I could do them better. Um, you know, I remember I was a tough critic. I'd be looking at details like the hands and say, yeah, this artist doesn't know how to draw fingernails. And, <laughs> and, uh, and that really, you know, and I was like five, six years old, but that was, that's where the, uh, the use of the narrative, like a structured narrative in terms of concept really started to, um, take its first shape in, in my own mind of how I perceive the construction of an image, right, mm-hmm. um, as subject. And so I, uh, I came across an interview that you did and you spoke about um, a memory of seeing a scene in the movie Roots. Um, can you tell us a little bit specifically about that scene? And, and, uh, and it really struck me because, again, I, I immediately recalled a very similar experience that I had um, early on in life that really was a powerful impact in the way that I saw the world and, and, and approached the world as an artist. Well, remind me of that scene. So you talked about um, where it's a, probably one of the climactic 
scenes where they, uh, the slave owner is about to, um, he's talking about teaching a lesson to one of his slaves because he's master and has one of the other sla fellow slaves like whipping mm -hmm. uh, the character. And um, yeah, so maybe just tell us a little bit and, and I'll, it, it'll make more sense once I counter it. Well, that's, I'm glad that you invoked that. I mean, it's, it's hard to even convey, because of course they, they redid Roots, and I thought they did a really good job. But, you know, we live in a, such a different world, and um, I think I was in, I want to say seventh grade. It was 77 or 78, so it's either seventh or eighth grade. And, um, you know, of course we didn't have cable TV. Well, no one had cable TV. It wasn't just right. my family, right? We didn't have cable TV. Uh, the internet existed only at MIT and, you know, Caltech and places like that. Um, so, you know, so when things appeared on TV, uh, it was amazing how certain things, right? You know, like a da the show Dallas, right? right. Or the nightly news, uh, nightly news programs, um, you know, uh, a program like Roots, a miniseries like Roots, uh, it was a really big deal. And so my parents were like, you, you know, we've got to watch this. And we sat and watched this. And of course, uh, it, was, it was fascinating because, you know, in my home, we had, a, my, I think my, my, my uh, mother had actually gotten Alex Haley's book. Um, and as it, according to her, as it turns out, he's actually a, a, a distant relative of mine on my father's side. But she'd gotten this book and they knew who Alex Haley was. And so we watched it at home. And then of course, when I went to school, I was uh, in a school where I was one of just a very, very few black students. So, okay, it was, a, it was a very different experience because, you know, there, I mean, I think that there, the, the, all the white students had watched Roots too. Well, everyone had watched Roots, right. right, parts of it. And, you know, it became like, you know, some of them were sort of fascinated by it, but then also, you know, they would like, you know, make jokes about it and stuff like this. I had to deal with that. but. It was, I mean, to see that image on the TV screen, on national TV screens, and to be a child, and you know, to have been told about slavery by your parents, and to have kind of, I mean, it was not at all discussed in, in school, um, but to have encountered it in books, but then to, to see it represented, particularly, in particular, how the white slave master had uh, one enslaved black person brutally beat this other, and how, uh, I think his name was, uh, was Kunta Kinte, he was being mm -hmm. whipped, right? And Kunta's defiance, right? He refused to accept and take the name that he was being given, right? He refused to be, I think the name was Toby, right? He refused to be called Toby, to accept that. He was like, you, basically what he was saying, and what was being represented for the entire, you know, viewing audience, was this black man, being whipped and trying to have his selfhood, his humanity, his identity, his rootedness, his history whipped out of him. Yeah. He was incredibly yeah. powerful. And he, he held on and held on and held on. And the man who was whipping him, I mean, he didn't want, of course he didn't want to keep doing it. But of course it could have meant they would all be punished. They, you know, I mean, they were viewed as investment, so they probably, you know, they might have been killed, maybe not, but they might have been maimed, hurt, whipped, whatever. Um, and then finally, he gives in. But it's, it, 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 you know, this is this extended scene. And that was astonishing to me. And I thought about that, because of course, the other thing that I'd also been steeped in growing up in the 1970s was this sense, I mean, it was the moment of um, the black, well, late 60s into early 70s, the black power movement, black pride, um, you know, Chicano pride. I mean, uh, you know, we would listen to uh, my, in my, my home reggae music. It was just a very different sort of sense of possibility. You know, I tell people that, you know, when I was a kid, we went to this school, sometimes we went to this little school on Saturdays, and we learned to do African dances. We learned all the capitals of the countries of Africa. I mean, just all these things, right? You know, um, how to draw. I mean, I mean the, the guy would say, you know, make a black person, you make a V with a circle on top to give a beautiful afro. You know? oh, you know? yeah. <laughs> it's like, sort of funny to think about it. But I say all this to say that, I mean, it was a, it was a kind of empowerment that was very, very po powerful. And that came, I mean, it was coming from you know, my home but, and from the 
aspects of the larger culture, but to see that on TV, something that could have been, and was in certain ways, deeply traumatic, but in other ways, incredibly empowering. That's something I think I've always carried with me, and that was something that informed counter-narratives. Right? Right. Now, I'm gonna sort of turn this back on you to say, because thinking of your work um, and how you sort of think about history, the research you've done, but also how you animate the past, right? And particularly these stories of resistance or in, in how you represent today, right? You bring the resistance out. Like where, does, where does that come from? What, what has inspired you? Well, I think, um, you know, in, in, in a similar fashion, I, I was probably about seven or eight years old and sitting in a movie theater with my family, somehow my father had convinced my mother to bring all the children to watch Oliver Stone's Platoon mm -hmm. that was debuting. <laughs> and I remember sitting in that row, and my, my father served in Vietnam from 70 to 72. Uh, you know, I knew about the tale of him being drafted, his experience over there, what he saw, what he did, um, his own questioning of why he was there, um, once he returned, you know, he shared these tales with me. And so I'll never forget sitting in that seat and my mother sort of nervously looking over to all three children saying, now if you need to close your eyes, don't be afraid, just cover your eyes. And that was just making my eyes like, what is gonna be so, what am I gonna see that's so um, scary? And so I'll never forget, you know, the powerful movie, but very graphic, very violent. And towards the very end of it, or I'd say somewhere in the middle, of the film, I was captivated not only by the film, but I was more intrigued by the power of this image and its capacity to keep an entire theater audience so deathly quiet mm -hmm. because everybody was focused on this moving image. And I remember looking around and repeat, like whispering to myself, that's what I want to do. Mm. I want to move an audience that way, mm -hmm. right? I want to create these large pictures that keep people intrigued, curious, skeptical, uh, and coming back for more. Mm -hmm. And so a year or two later, I, um, I began, uh, I became a young muralist, and so, I would follow around uh, a good friend of mine who was 18 years old at the time, tremendous artist. Um, and I was, he, here I was, this nine-year-old kid, and, we, and I'd, he'd take me into the housing projects in San Antonio wow. with him, and it forever changed my world. It was my first real education, mm -hmm. because I would be sitting on these scaffolds, and he, I was, he said I was too small to climb to the top of the scaffold, so he would make me stay at the bottom. He'd do the top half of these two- or three-story uh, project buildings, and I do all the bottom parts. And, you know, I lived these, some of these projects were maybe a mile or two from where the community I grew up in, but it was like night and day. Mm -hmm. you know, I grew up in a lower middle class community, and this was entirely different, right? But what really struck me was the experience, the memory of these. Um, individuals in their own community coming up and the pride of seeing their own experiences and their own faces in these images that we uh, were creating, oh, it really changed my entire perception of the world because I thought this is a way to interact with other fellow human beings, mm -hmm. especially fellow human beings who remained on the outskirts or on the margins of society, right? Because it, on the other hand, it really changed my own perspective of America, right? I saw for the first time what it was to be the have and the have nots, mm -hmm. right? And I saw how um, police patrolled in that area and how they acted differently from other neighborhoods where we had painted other murals in better neighborhoods, right? And so mm -hmm. I remember back then vowing to, I wanted to make work that was about people and for people, and that was something that was so deeply ingrained in me that I never really uh, left behind. Mm -hmm. um, now, it started to change once I, um, you know, through other experiences, like once I went up to the Rhode Island School of Design, because here I was bringing this, all of this um, knowledge and experience and history with me and putting it on this brand new platform 
at somewhere like an elite institution like, institution like RISD, and in a way, it was a complete like lashing out against what I was doing, right? And so it was really a, a very important, I mean, these are all very important experiences that I feel that I've kept very, that I still carry with me, and that are still very much injected into the work. Um, well, let me ask, how did people respond? Uh, how did your classmates respond when you went to uh, RISD? And how did, how did you feel yourself changing uh, as an artist, um, especially given uh, the training that you, I mean, because that's really amazing training to be, to, you know, be a little kid and to be uh, and engaged in mural painting and to sort of have these interactions. I mean, that's, you can't, you know, you can't pay for that. Sure, you know, you think sure. that's invaluable in terms of like, you know, sort of seeing the power of art, but also being engaged in art making. I mean, it's wonderful sure. that you were involved in that. So a lot of these subjects that I was portraying immediately once I landed at, at RISD, uh, you know, I was sort of a, a strange case, I think, for a lot of my professors because most, the majority of my peers at that moment in you know, our young career, like most people are just trying to develop a craft and a skill. But I felt like I was already equipped and I was already a little bit ahead of the game because I was developing concepts, right? right. And, um, and so I had a lot of professors that just didn't know quite what to do with me. Um, and then towards my, la my final two years at that school, um, I, I really dove deep into figuring out this is what I want to say, this is what I want to do, this is the direction I want to head. And I just did what I wanted to do and disregarded you know, everything and anything else. And so uh, I'll never forget in my final year at school, I was doing a critique, my, my exit critiques, and, uh, and I had created a piece um, about the Zoot Suit Riots in, in Los Angeles, 19, uh, I think 42, 43, a full-blown race riot between these Chicano, Pachuco, Mexican-American hipsters wearing these Zoot Suits versus uh, American military men. Yeah. And, um, and so I created this large painting, and I just thought, this is it. This was an epiphany. Like, I am never turning back. This is a lost piece of a, a chapter of American, of the American experience. Why don't I know about this? Mm -hmm. right? These guys all look just like I did in those photos where they've been stripped naked, and they've been pissed on, they've been beaten, and the LAPD are nabbing them and throwing them into the paddy wagons. Um, and I couldn't, I was really blown away that there were, it really was the first time that I realized there are selective chapters and episodes in American history. Mm -hmm. And so I had this one professor that said, you really must stop doing this subject matter. Nobody cares. Nobody wants to hear about this. Nobody wants to see this. You will never have a career in art if you don't stop doing this stuff. And I remember it just, um, it really awakened something inside of me. I thought, I'll show you, <laughs> right? And, so, and ever since then, it's, it's, um, it really proved to me that why it was even much more necessary than I even realized to, to tell these stories, right? Um, and when I brought that painting home, uh, I hung it like in a coffee shop because I had nowhere to exhibit. And, and this coffee shop was right next door to a Navy recruitment office. And so in the painting, it shows these, these sailors, you know, in this very graphic scene, um, in this clash with these Mexican-American men. And, and I knew I was doing something correct when the sailor, or when the, the recruiter came over because he would buy his coffee from that place every morning. And he looked at this painting and he ran out, according to the <laughs> owner, and brought in his higher ranking officer. And the guy said, you need to take this down right now. And I immediately thought of my, um, of the painters that had come before me, like Paul Cadmus, a mm -hmm. brilliant American painter who had a very similar experience for painting Sailors and Floozies in 1939. Mm -hmm. um, and the Admiral actually tried to get him censored from the Whitney Museum and Museum of Modern Art and was successful. But I knew at that moment, like there really, again, there just was no turning back. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and, and, and here I am. <laughs> yeah. okay. Well, now you mentioned Cadmus. Uh, I know you also, another person that you 
uh, really admire uh, is um, Philip Gustin. Who are some of the other artists who've inspired you that you've, you feel you're, you're working in conversation with? Sure. Um, most of them are, are long gone, but, um, you know, and, and I'd say I have about a handful of painters that have always been the ones that I seek out when I've hit roadblocks throughout different points in my career or life. They've been the ones that I understand their language. We speak the same language uh, in different ways. Um, Philip Gustin, George Bellows, Kathy Colwitz, um, Peter Saul, who's still around, um, Leon Golub, who's gone, Otto Dix, uh, Christian Shad. Um, these painters for me all have many, some things in common, like they're figurative, they're damn good draftsmen and women, their craft and their skill, their narrative, they are outspoken, especially in times of crisis. Mm -hmm. um, but the one thing that I admire about each one of these individuals, Charles White's another one, um, each one of them in their own unique ways during their lifetimes and career, when the art world said, we are going this way, mm -hmm. these specific painters that said, see ya, I'm going this way. Right. Right? And that's the one thing that's always really intrigued me and attracted me and made me a devout follower of, of what they do. Mm -hmm. How about you? Like, who are some artists that um, have really been significant for you in terms of inspiration um, throughout your lifetime and, and career, whether it's as, a, as an artist in general? That's a great question. I mean, so, I mean, I, I, could, I could go on and on. I mean, it, I think about musicians that have been important, uh, visual artists have been important, uh, and uh, of course, you, when it comes to writers, I mean, one of the most important to me, um, I mean, I actually, I was crying when she passed away, it's Toni Morrison. Sure. You know, um, and I, I used to think, you know, am I saying, I mean, I love Toni Morrison's work, and at one point, you know, I, had, I, I have every one of her books, and any time I had the opportunity to go see her read, I would go see her read or give a talk, um, and, but, it, you know, when, when, when my books have come out and people have asked me, you know, which writers do you admire? You know, and I say Toni Morrison, I sometimes think they're thinking, oh, you know, he's just gonna pick the, you know, the, 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 most great, the greatest, or one of the greatest, uh, you know, living uh, black writers, black women writers. Uh, but, I mean, she was incredibly important uh, to me. Um, another one was Alice Walker. Uh, when I was uh, starting out, I used to read Alice Walker's poems and stories and just to see her move between, you know, poetry and fiction, her early novels, she was in, in, incredibly important. Um, another uh, person who was incredibly important uh, also just passed away was a professor I had, Paul Marshall, who was just such a graceful writer and graceful person. And, uh, you know, she, she had a, a bit of sternness. Right? Uh, she was right. a beige and American. <laughs> but, but she was also incredibly warm and incred incredibly generous. Um, and then, of course, any number of, uh, you know, other writers, uh, I mean, I think about writers that I've had as teachers, people like uh, Ishmael Reed and E.L. Doctorow, uh, writers that I've admired uh, from afar, uh, people like um, uh, Jay Wright, uh, uh, Sonia Sanchez, et cetera, uh, you know, writers, sort of iconic, some iconic American writers, people like William Faulkner. I mean, I, I, I remember at one point, you know, of course, after you kind of confront uh, Faulkner's troubled racial politics, right. you know, um, I felt this way that, you know, once I sort of was able to kind of grapple with his troubled racial politics, I could really sort of appreciate the extraordinary writer he, he was, right? You know, he sort of is, is, you know, I think there's a strain of the Faulknerian, of course, that appears in any number of contemporary American writers, including someone like Toni Morrison, and then, of course, is even in, in my work as well. So I think, you know, um, it's, it's a wide array, and it's not only just uh, U.S. writers. I mean, I remember at a certain point when I was uh, in my teens and 20s, I mean, coming across writers like Gabriel Garcia Marquez and Jorge Luis Borges and stuff, um, how important they were. Because also, you know, uh, uh, Eduardo Galeano, the great writer, who gives a kind of, provides a kind of counter narrative, which was a huge inspiration of the Americas. He sort of rewrites the history of Americas. Of this, I think it's called the Century of Fire. Um, series of books. I mean, all these writers were so important. And I always try to, you know, be open uh, and to be learning. Um, I mean, and of course, I'm realizing I'm mostly mentioning fiction writers, but of course, there are any number of, you know, poets, 
playwrights, et cetera, as well as, uh, as, as, as people in the visual arts. So as, uh, of course, it's, it's easy to ask an artist what motivates you, what encourages you, what, what inspires you um, when you're making your work, but I'm always more interested in today, right now, what conflicts you as an artist? What are you conflicted with? What do you struggle with? Um, it could be anything. I mean, because I think that as artists, um, you don't hear a lot of, I don't hear a lot of, about the struggles of an artist in terms of when you're really, it's all, when it's personal almost, right? When you're in your space, in your zone, going down that rabbit hole. Mm -hmm. like what are the things that really, um, that you're really struggling to work through? That's a great question. So I'm gonna ask you the same question <laughs> in a minute. But, you know, so beyond the sort of purely personal uh, challenge of time and time management and the sort of demands of uh, everyday life and my job, one of the things I've really been thinking about is, you know, how to, how to speak to the moment. I've always been very impressed by uh, writers, so I'll pick another one, who I, you know, an artist, who can speak directly to the moment, who can, you know, something happens and they can write and respond and it's incredibly powerful, right? I think if, you know, so June Jordan was one, a huge inspiration, Amir Baraka was another, right? These are two, two figures, mm -hmm. I mean, and they could just, you know, something could happen and Amir Baraka would have a poem the next day, right? And I, I don't write that quickly, right? I have to sort of think about things and process things. Uh, it takes me a while. So, I mean, with poetry, I can write it more quickly than fiction. But I, I, I feel like, you know, that, that our moment demands, it demands from all of us, not so much even a response as ways of reconceptualizing the possibility the possibilities for our future, right? Particularly given all of the things we're facing, you know, from the macro like climate change to the micro, like, you know, the various crises that affect, you know, in fact, uh, affecting this society and, you know, many, many others across the globe. Um, and of course, I don't want to, I want to be clear that I see the two as being, I don't think they're distinct. I think they're all interrelated. But I feel like, you know, how do I do that? And that is a challenge, right? How do I do that? I mean, one of the things I'll say, and not to go on too long, but just with counter narratives, so it took me a long time to write this book. Part of it was losing a number of the stories when a computer crashed, right? So please back up your computers. <laughs> um, but when I finally produced it, you know, I had this concern that, oh, you know, it's going to be in the back of my mind. It was sort of a concern. It was like, oh, it's going to be, you know, passe and people are going to say, oh, not another book, you know, that has slavery in it. I mean, I do sometimes see people online saying, oh my God, you know, there's just like another movie about slavery. All we have, movie, is, have is movies about slavery. And then you think, I, know, I sort of ask myself, I mean, in the grand scheme of all the films in the United States, right, the American cinema that have been made about chattel slavery that have actually been true to the experience, how many are there? And I mean, right. of course, actually, that's like almost none, right? right? right. And you think about it, and that's just one aspect of our history, right? Okay, you know. Um, you know, just sort of in, ask you to talk about this, just thinking about the conversation we were having earlier about Chavez Ravine, right? And that has, I mean, this, this history that just, you know, just gets erased, right? I mean, it's, it's carried in the bodies of people. Right. It's carried in the memories. It's carried in oral stories. And sometimes, you know, scholars, you know, historians, sociologists do actually kind of focus on it, but it's not part of the sort of popular culture, right? Uh, it's, it's not part of the kind of national myths that we carry around. So. So I realized, I thought, you know, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this book, and the book, the book goes past slavery, it carries into the 20th century, actually up to today. And the fascinating thing was, I realized when it appeared in 2015, it actually was the 150th anniversary of the end of the Civil War. So the book felt to me almost out of time, and then it was actually very timely. And a friend then pointed out to me that I believe 2015 was actually the year that the British families who had owned slavery, owned slaves who had been involved in slavery, ceased receiving, ended, finally got the final compensation for having to give up, you know, 
their plantations and things like this. Things like this. So 2015 was actually this incredibly auspicious year. And so in a sense, it was, I realized, okay, so I, you know, but, but also in this, it was a, this book appeared in the moment, you know, when we were thinking, we were sort of, you know, I was thinking and writing and debating and uh, fighting in the streets about, you know, about deaths of, um, you know, of people like um, Trayvon Martin and uh, Michael Brown and uh, so many others, right? And, and, and again, and the book has stories in which, you know, black bodies are policed, right? Black bodies are surveilled, right? Black bodies are, black people are, are punished. Not just black people, people of color, right? So I realized that, in fact, uh, I actually was speaking to the moment even though I was writing about the past. But there's something I'm often very anxious about, you know, how do I respond to this moment? And of course, it's in a, in a sense, I sometimes feel, you know, because literature is a slower thing, in certain types of literature are slower than others, uh, as opposed to, you know, being able to draw or uh, come up with other forms of representation that seem, sometimes it, in certain ways seems, seem quicker. You know, how do you do this? How do you speak to the moment? Because part of what I feel like we, we, we badly need is to reactivate our imaginations, right? To, to, right. to, to uh, and not just, not just a few of us, but as many of us as possible. Sure. Because, you know, you know, time, I feel like time is running out. Sure, and, and uh, you know, I think when you look at history um, throughout various civilizations, I mean, it's, People have always turned to, to the artist, right, mm -hmm. for um, for a testimony, mm -hmm. and I think that that's why. And you know, I always think about the amazing writer uh, Ronaldo Arenas, who's yeah. a poet and Another one, yeah. And I remember, you know, he died of AIDS in the early '90s, and maybe a year or two before he passed, there's this amazing short clip of him being interviewed on a rooftop in New York City, and the interviewer asks, "Why do you write?" And without any hesitation, without a blink, he looks dead in the camera and he says, revenge. <laughs> I thought, oh, that's great. I mean, here's somebody who's exiled from his country, imprisoned, mm -hmm. tortured, right? Um, and I think that that's probably one of the struggles that um, haunts me pretty often in the studio, especially today, is, you know, I, I, I can't, I'm reminded of painters like Gustin who, that, you know, the world is dying outside. They are loving, they're fighting. Um, and my biggest dilemma is, should I use cadmium red or cobalt blue, <laughs> right? Uh, and so I think that, you know, there is that sort of tug of war in the studio. Um, some moments it's more intensive than others. Uh, but at the end of the day, I have the luxury of making a picture and sometimes that's really hard to deal with and to grasp, um, especially when you mix in um, commerce, right, and the art market. Um, but I think the thing that really allows me to find a sense of optimism and hope even, or especially in tackling such challenging, heavy subjects, um, is just reminding myself that it just takes one spark, right? You know, I don't think that painting can change the world, mm -hmm. but to be able to provide moments of silence mm -hmm. in an age where it's of noise, mm -hmm. right? To be able to provide moments of clarity mm -hmm. in a world where um, there is much distortion and delusion, mm -hmm. for me, that's what makes it all worth it, right? Mm -hmm. That I have... Um, I'm grateful to have the opportunity to provide any one of those things just for one individual person. And so then that leads me to think or to be reminded of, um, you know, it's one spark to ignite a wildfire, right? And so I think that um, I'm starting to hear, I'm starting to see, especially in the youth, and it's always in the youth, right? But I'm starting to realize that there is, um, there's individuals now that I'm hearing more and that I'm seeing more and I'm encountering more that are waking up to the idea that um, we, there is something still worth fighting for, 
right? Because it's so easy, like we were talking earlier, yesterday and today, I mean, it's so easy to bury your head in the sand, right. especially with all the noise around, right? On a daily level, in, in very insane levels of noise and, and distortion. And, and, um, but I think what's most crucial is that we have to remember as artists, as citizens, and as, as, and as human beings that we must continue to fight not for profit, not to gain some sort of celebrity fame, but because fighting back against something um, that is oppressive is worth, uh, um, is the right thing to do. And it's that simple. You fight back because it's the right thing to do. And I feel like that's something that we've really lost touch with in, uh, as, a, as a collective society, right? Because it's easily, I mean, I, look, I, I think that um, American minds aren't really trained, or actually I should say, American minds are trained from a very, very early age to not think so critically. I mean, I think about like George Carlin, the great comedian who said, they want to keep you just smart enough to clock in the work right. and just dumb enough <laughs> to not question anything, right? Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I think that the artist really has um, that sensibility and that power for others to be a reminder, right? Mm-hmm. To serve as a reminder. Um, but you know, that's, that's, a, that's a big responsibility. Right. But I think that we all have this, this equal responsibility It may be painting for me, writing for John, something else for each one of you. Um, But that's extreme. Yeah, I just, it's extremely important to just remind yourselves of that. Um, Well, I feel like this, it's interesting because, you know, in in this society, there are many incentives not to fight. Uh, There are many incentives to really sort of go along with the program. Or, of course, the flip of that is uh, not, not, you know, the ways in which they get people to sort of tune out. I mean, one of the things that I found so interesting, you know, there was, uh, and not to make this a political discussion, but the Senate Intelligence Committee issued this, you know, they issued their bipartisan report, right? It, was kind of, it kind of got buried about a week or two ago about uh, the Russian involvement in the 2016 election. And one of the things that I found that, I, you know, People have sort of commented on it online, but I found really fascinating was how the Russians targeted African Americans. And what they did was, on the one hand, you know, they, it seems like what they did, you know, they said, you know, basically, just don't, don't be part of this. Don't be part of this election. Uh, you know, it's just a waste of your time. Uh, you know, sit it out or vote for a third party candidate or whatever. And they used sort of, you know, basically, you know, deterred, you know, uh, kind of mutant version of you know, aspects of black nationalism to turn people against, right. you know, fighting, right, against speaking out, right. Uh, you know, and the, the, but the other, other way that they did it was just to kind of just shut people down, right, you know. And I just think about, like, how powerful, you know, social media as a tool is, right? It's, it's not even just a tool, it's a weapon, right? And how, I mean, even when sometimes we, th- we know that we should be fighting or, or you know, and, uh, and sort of think about, you know, okay, you know, we, we have these challenges in front of us, right? How easy it is to either be sort of diverted into, you know, I don't know, I won't, won't, don't want to call it nonsense, but something that's, you know, just like a time waster or whatever, or to just, you know, have, a feeling of helplessness inculcated, and of course, we you know we were talking earlier. You know, people, there are people who really, I mean, you know, I think we all legitimately feel helpless at times, and there are people who you know for a variety of reasons do feel helpless, and it's not just because they are. I mean, because everything really is stacked against them. You know, you think about people who are put back in jail because they can't make bail, and the bail is set so that you know, in part, to help some of these cities you know, basically uh, build up their, you know, revenues. And so, the, I mean, the decks really are stacked against those people, you know, the people who are facing the challenge. And, I mean, you know, one, you know, beautifully, there, someone, uh, there's a uh, uh, scholar out there, Courtney Ziegler, who with some other people came up with a, um, 
uh, program, uh, an app to just help people, you know, collect loose change to, uh, you know, um, help people pay their bills. But little, I mean, there are little things like that that, you know, that people are doing, these sort of strategic acts that are fighting back and they don't get a lot of, uh, you know, get a lot of uh, attention. But I'm, I am really interested in, you know, how powerful these tools are because, I mean, I sometimes think, you know, even when I'm, you know, I have feeling that, you know, I'm doing something to, to uh, as you say, get people to think, get people to pay attention, get people to pause. Um, you're up against something that's almost like, you know, so huge, so vast, so powerful. I mean, you know, what is the effect of, you know, how effective is, is the work that you're doing, right? Um, and I try not to ever lose hope. I mean, I was saying this to a young writer uh, recently. She was saying, you know, what do you do when you, you start to feel, you know, that you've lost hope? And I said, I never lose hope. Yeah. And part of it, it was because I saw, well, you know, my parents and the people around them, but I saw, you know, Kunta Kinte saying, you are not yeah. going to make me call myself Toby, you know, yeah. at that young age. But, yeah. um, and, you know, and, and just think about all the work, uh, you know, sort of like that, you know. Yeah. Um, but that's something that's, I, I, I do think, you know, um, that this idea of, you know, ways of getting people to feel empowered is, it, think, it, it, artists who, who think about ways to do that and to make sure that's a component of their work, I think it's just so important. And one of the things that I think is so beautiful is that we're in a moment now where people are actually being honored and credited for right. doing that kind of work, as opposed to a, you know, being sort of immersed in a kind of aestheticism, or as I was saying earlier, art for art's sake approach that, that you know, involves sort of shutting out you know, the social, the political, right. the economic. Right, and I, and I think, for me, that's why the figure is so imperative. It's the, the nucleus of my image is because we're all walking memorials, right? We are living, breathing memorials. Of, we, deeply embedded in each one of us is history, is a history, is histories, right? And, uh, um, but, um, you know, I, I think that one of the things that has really always captured my attention is, is the idea of, America being painfully trapped between the myth of who we think we are and the reality of who we really are. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's really, I agree, it's a very fascinating moment to be, I feel so fortunate to be around and witness to this moment in time because all of these, every, these things that have been buried far beneath our own foundation under our feet is now we're seeing it literally resurface, right? Mm -hmm. It's always been there. It's always been there. And I think communities of color have always known exactly. that it was there, right? right. And, uh, and so, I re, you know, in 2015, when I created this piece, The City, that was this large 35-foot um, painting of a gathering in 21st century of these clans, men, women, and child, to me, one of the most important segments of that image was the very first lone panel that tends to get overlooked um, because of the spectacle of these larger-than-life um, hooded figures. Mm -hmm. But the pile for those who really took the time to pay attention was everything that, was, that had been resurfaced, right? It's almost mm -hmm. oozing out of our soil. It's almost the bones. There's these discarded mattresses, and it's a pile of trash, but it's, it becomes very... Um, figurative, mm -hmm. right? It's the carcasses, right? The shells left behind from those who have been forgotten, trampled over, um, you know, throughout 400 years. And, uh, but it always really, you know, it was such a, a challenge with that painting um, to try to encourage the viewer to just for one second look beyond the photo bombing of this hooded family, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but I think that the, the figure for me has always been so, it reveals, it's, 
it reveals a mirror, right? It's a mirror of all of us, mm-hmm. right? Regardless of skin color, regardless of background and, um, and story, it's, it's really, um, it's a reflection of all of our own um, experience at this moment in time. Like these are, these are individuals like this portrait here. I mean, it might be entirely foreign to you and I, right? complete opposite of our, of our background and of our daily existence. But it's my intention to try just for a second to encourage you to see how, to understand how you may be connected mm-hmm. to this other individual, right? And so, um, but that's a, you know, I realize it's a very challenging thing. To, I mean, Baldwin said it most amazing. I am, I am astonished by the length that a person or a people will go in order to avoid looking into a truthful mirror, mm-hmm. right? That mirror is the hardest thing to do for all of us, right? right? But once you can acknowledge that reflection in the mirror, then you can acknowledge uh, the issues, right? The bigger issues. And I think that that's something that we really struggle with as, as a society here is um, there's a reason that history gets so distorted and forgotten and intentionally erased because um, the past is still speaking to us, right? It's the voices of the dead right. calling our names. It's up to us to figure out whether we are going to listen or not. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I'm glad you mentioned, I mean, I was thinking about James Baldwin, and uh, I mean, both as a fiction writer and as an essayist, I was also thinking of another you know, person who I actually write about in the book, Langston Hughes. I mean, these figures that uh, really kind of call attention in interesting ways through language to, you know, the, co- the country's complex and difficult history. I mean, I was thinking also when you're talking about the figure, uh, you know, one of the key th- things that I always hope, you know, when we're reading and writing fiction, that we remember is that fiction often involves a radical othering, right? So it's, lo- you know, sort of looking at the other and not only seeing oneself, but entering that other's body, that other's mind, that other space. That doesn't mean that we know, we know that person or we become that person, but it, 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 it means we step outside ourselves. Right. I think that's absolutely crucial. I mean, I, I feel like, you know, um, so often, you know, in the sort of larger history, when you talk about communities of color, we, we have to do that, right? People of color have to do that. But, you know, when you talk about the majoritarian society, you know, they, they have not had to do that, right? And, um, and so I also, you know, as a writer, one of the things that I... I want to do is something akin to working with a figure. So working with character, working with language, right? Working with plot, working with these various tools, right? To allow us to enter these spaces, particularly in terms of U.S. history, that have been, you know, um, obscured, occluded, um, omitted, right? Suppressed. Because I think, you know, uh, it's, it's absolutely, it, it, it allows us to then see the present with much more, as you say, much more clarity. Sure. Right? Yeah. Right? And then to move forward, you know, or to move. Right. 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 Yeah. How are we doing on time? Okay. We, so, yeah, yeah, we, yeah, we will do it. Um, yes. Yeah, we've got a, a nice little um, collaborative surprise for for you and uh, let's let's go for it. Yeah. If we could dim the uh, the lights up here, that'd be amazing. When you said bread, do you mean broke? When you said peace, do you mean fast? You said first, did you mean forgotten? You said past, did you mean least? You said woman, did you mean wither? You said man, did you mean master? When you said mother, did you mean smother? When you said father, did you mean fatal? When you said sister, did you mean surrender? When you said brother, did you mean brutal? When you said fellow, did you mean follow? When you said couple, did you mean capital? When you said family, did you mean failure? When you said mankind, did you mean market? When you said society, did you mean sickness? When you said democracy, did you mean indignity? When you said equality, did you mean empty? When you said politics, did you mean power? When you said left, did you mean lost? When you 
You said right, did you mean might? When you said republic, did you mean rich? When you said wealthy, did you mean wall? When you said poor, did you mean prison? When you said justice, did you mean just us? When you said immigrant, did you mean enemy? When you said refugee, did you mean refusal? When you said earth, did you mean ownership? When you said soil, did you mean oil? When you said community, did you mean conflict? When you said safety, did you mean suspicion? When you said security, did you mean sabotage? When you said army, did you mean Armageddon? When you said white, did you mean welcome? When you said black, did you mean back? When you said yellow, did you mean yield? When you said brown, did you mean down? When you said we, did you mean war? When you said you, did you mean useless? When you said she, did you mean suffer? When you said he, did you mean horror? When you said they, did you mean threat? When you said I, did you mean island? When you said tribe, did you mean trouble? When you said name, did you mean nobody? When you said news, did you mean nonsense? When you said media, did you mean miasma? When you said success, did you mean sucker? When you said fame, did you mean game? When you said ideal, did you mean idol? When you said yesterday, did you mean travesty? When you said today, did you mean doomsday? When you said tomorrow, did you mean never? When you said hear, did you mean hush? When you said listen, did you mean limit? When you said write, did you mean wound? When you said read, did you mean retreat? When you said literacy, did you mean apathy? When you said fiction, did you mean forget? When you said poetry, did you mean passivity? When you say art, do you mean act? A big thank you to John and Vincent. And we do have time for just a handful of questions before we break for the book signing in the lobby. Um, I'll open it up and I'll let it to y'all. Uh, well, I'll just say this. So uh, a few years ago, I went to a wonderful conference called uh, Ad Fempo uh, in New York, Advancing Feminist Poetry uh, and Poetics. And the poet Eileen Miles, uh, who had taught at the University of San Diego, made this wonderful statement. She said to the artists in the room, always remember when it comes to academe, you, are, you might be uh, in it, but you need not be of it. In terms of uh, institutions, I, I always feel like as an artist, as a writer, I am suspicious of the institution that I work for. I'm suspicious of you know, the work that institutions do. I mean, they do great things, but uh, they are very powerful. Universities are very powerful organizations. And uh, they do, when I mean, you think about the many uh, wonderful things that they ha do do and have done, I also have to, I'm also trying to be mindful at the same time of their history, right? And sometimes it's been, you know, in many institutions, a very ugly history. Uh, I always uh, urge people to look at Craig Stephen Wilder's wonderful book, Ebony and Ivy, which uh, explores the history of America's earliest universities. And uh, I mean, it's, you know, when you 
sort of read, uh, you know, the story of uh, how many of these universities came into being and uh, who they, on whose backs they came into being on, right, it makes you really kind of rethink, um, you know, uh, what it is they're doing and uh, what it is they've done. In terms of, uh, so, so I, I think I, I always, uh, you know, approach uh, my relationship with uh, academe with some skepticism. Uh, and at the same time, I take tremendous joy in teaching and working with students, working with amazing colleagues, working with amazing staff people, right? Um, uh, doing work that, you know, within the institution that we can share with the wider world, right? Uh, you know, I mean, thank God for, I mean, one of the reasons, you know, the United States uh, in some ways is uh, a major leader uh, in the world is, you know, is due in no small part to our public and private universities uh, and colleges and, of course, our entire educational system. Um, in terms of the, the limits that the artist places on uh, the professor, I mean, you know, as I once jokingly said at a reading, I would love to basically be spending all of my time writing novels and, you know, fiction and poetry, right? You know, and essays and, you know, doing translations. Um, uh, with, with teaching as part of it, right? But, uh, you know, but I also realize that, you know, I, that I have to pay the bills and um, so I have to kind of compartmentalize and uh, sort of think about what my duties are uh, as, a, as a professor, as a teacher, as a mentor, as a guide, as an administrator, I do a lot of administrative work now, and sometimes set the, you know, the art making aside with the with the uh, recognition that the spark that keeps that going also keeps me going uh, as a teacher. What he said. <laughs> <laughs> Great question. So I, uh, as far as um, researching or, or f selecting subjects of, um, you know, that are considered ignored or lost uh, chapters of history, I don't, I don't know that I necessarily seek them out. Um, each one of the subjects from The Strangest Fruit to The Zoot Suit Riots, they were all subjects that I just accidentally stumbled across, whether they were... Usually the way it works out is, like for example, I'll be watching a film and there might be, there was a, a line in this film that I saw, you know, when I was a child and, and it always stuck with me because they talked about, it was the opening sequence of the, the film um, American Me and it shows how um, the main character was conceived and, he, and, and his father was a U.S. sailor that raped a Mexican-American woman during the, the riots. And it always kind of stuck with me because I didn't understand what that was. And then, you know, as I, 20 years later, um, 1988, you know, I, I stumbled across, um, it was my first time on the internet at school. And, um, and I typed that in and I remembered, I mean, back then I probably found one paragraph on it, right? But it was just enough to spark my interest. And because there was no available photographic resources um, that documented that event, uh, it gave me every reason to paint it, right? As far as selecting my palette, or you asked about how I distort the figures um, and the palette in the paintings. Um, I mean, I think that's a number of things. The, uh, you know, I've been called everything from a realist to a photorealist, which uh, means nothing to me. Uh, you know, I think that for me, it's, it's merely about it's not about getting my anatomy correct. It's not about creating form to look like form. I mean, that's all important, but the utmost challenge on that canvas or that piece of paper is to give these individuals a sense of existence and presence. They have to have weight. They have to have 
they have to pulsate with energy. Um, and I think that doing, utilizing dynamic color and a dynamic palette has always been not only uh, a technical aspect uh, of a, you know, in terms of bringing these, these characters to life, but I take even components like my lighting, dramatic lighting is very important in all of this, this work. Lighting becomes, goes, serves as something even more than just, you know, classical um, aesthetics for lighting your, your subjects. The lighting itself becomes metaphoric. It becomes symbolic. It becomes as important as the portrait itself. Because in most of these cases of these images, the lighting is the optimism, right? It's, it's really, um, it's the pulse in a dying heartbeat, right? That lighting just, and that color, it keeps it alive. Um, you know, my goal is always to, to keep the viewer there. And so if, if I can't get them with an interesting nose and ears, then maybe I can get them with color. If I can't get them with color, then I can get them with lighting. And so at the end of the day, I mean, they're also tricks, right? Um, and that, in case you're also a painter, um, that's just practice. It, it's playing and experimenting uh, as much as you possibly can, right? And, and learning how to be your own best editor. Some things work, some things don't. Um, yeah, I hope that, that helps. Anybody else? Go first. Sure. Uh, I think it always is a part of uh, my art making. To give you a very good example, uh, one of the stories in Counter Narratives is about a very famous uh, woman acrobat, uh, Olga Kyra, Miss Lala, who was painted by Edgar Degas in 1879. She is the only black subject that Degas ever painted. And interestingly, it's <coughs> to me, interestingly to me, you know, Degas actually had black family members in Louisiana and went to Louisiana, and uh, he actually has paintings uh, set in Louisiana, but there are no black, I believe, I believe there are no black figures. But he went to the circus, Cirque Fernando, in Paris, and he saw Miss Lala, and he was spellbound. So, I didn't know, I didn't know anything about her. I happened to be in a library, of, um, pardon me, in a, uh, the Morgan Library, in a museum, the Morgan Library in New York. There was an exhibit on her, it transfixed me. When I walked out of that exhibit, I said, I have to tell her story. I was, as I was sort of walking and thinking, I was asking myself, how am I gonna tell this story? And intuition led me to think, she performed on a high wire, she never fell in all the years she performed. Uh, she was so extraordinary. Uh, that I mean, she had, wherever she traveled, she drew like, you know, like huge crowds of people. And I thought that my story should be like a high wire. So the story starts down the page and ends down the page, and it is one continuous sentence. And it's like four or five pages, and it's like, how do you sustain a story? Of course, people have written books that are in one single sentence, right? <laughs> but I didn't want to, I wasn't trying to write that. That big, a, that big a story. But I wanted to capture this moment in her life when she's on the high wire and moving back and forth through time and keeping myself on a kind of high wire. But that was all, to, that was all intuition, right? uh, motivated by the visual image of this really extraordinary figure uh, that Degas painted. That's awesome to hear you say that because uh, that's one of the things I forgot to bring up was uh, there's a lot of movement in the way you write. I read your words the way that I view drawings, right? Mm -hmm. And I could feel a lot of movement. Um, we can continue that later. But right. <laughs> intuition is everything, right? You can learn to draw. You can learn to paint. You can learn to use color. You can learn to stretch a canvas. But nobody can teach you. There's not one. You can't turn to a YouTube tutorial to learn 
artistic intuition. That comes with doing it for a very long time. Uh, you get better at it, but for me, intuition is the backbone of deciding what I choose to create and what I choose to, to edit out, right? Mm -hmm. um, you have to, one of the, the amazingly um, difficult things to really learn to do in the studio as an artist is to learn to listen to that voice, right? And to really learn to listen to it because sometimes that voice is just a crazy fucking voice that just doesn't shut up. And then there's, but to really learn when that voice is trying to speak to you and, 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 and inform you about what is worth pursuing in, in the work, um, oh, that's incredibly valuable. Um, you know, when I, when I start a painting, there's plenty of times where I walk away and say, yeah, you know what, it might have been a great idea two weeks ago, but today and tomorrow, I just don't think it's going to work. Um, the, the moment, the timing's not right. Um, it's not where it needs to be. And so, uh, yeah, that's, that's, I think that's one of the most powerful things about being creative and being good. A good artist is learning to trust your instincts, right? And that's one of the things that I would always talk to a young artist about is um, just learning even, especially at a young age, how to start training yourself to hear that voice and to trust in that voice, right? Um, without it, you know, I, I think that um, it compromises the work and it, and, it, and it really is hard to achieve um, the goals of being uh, a powerful artist if you don't, without instinct and intuition. <laughs> yeah, for a long time I was like, oh, you're the boxing guy, right? Um, boxing for me was a, a primary subject for about almost 10 years in the studio. Um, it was sparked by a very lame experience. When I was at school, I had the brilliant idea of joining a boxing club um, <laughs> that had no weight divisions. And so I was being kicked into the ring with like guys that were twice my size. And, but what I gained from it um, was it wasn't, I never went in thinking, okay, maybe I have a shot. Like I can win. No, it was, it was always, how in the hell am I going to walk out of here alive? <laughs> and, uh, and so then I wised up very quickly uh, after a few blows to the face. And I went into the studio and I said, you know what? I can't do it in the ring, but I can do it in the studio. And so what I loved about boxing was the history behind it, mm -hmm. right? The, uh, what it symbolized as metaphor and subject. Um, it had all the theatrics of everyday life, right? It was the drama, the, uh, the idea that you walk into that ring alone. It was like this test. Uh, a rite of passage, and I think then I started getting really interested in the idea of boxing as metaphor for um, young men, especially young men of color in America, right? Boxing is the golden ticket out of the barrios, the slums, ghettos, right? Um, and so then, you know, I started sprouting. I, I, I think the first significant series I did was titled Stations After the Stations of the Cross. I wasn't interested in the idea of Catholicism, the, story, the narrative of, of strictly being Catholic, but it was more about widening this periscope. Like, how many times throughout world history has this same tale been told, right? About this, this young male who's trying to find his way in the world and maybe gets lost, um, but every time falls, tries to get back up. I mean, that was the whole point, was getting back up. Right? You know, I was thinking about the immigrant experience, uh, all of these different sort of layers to one subject. And, uh, and then again, I started to realize that I was becoming that boxing guy, so I stopped doing it. Um, but you know, it's still there. Like, I still love the idea. I'm painting a little tiny portrait on my easel of a, of a young boxer from San Antonio. And um, I'm thinking about just starting to slowly get back into it. But, uh, very cautiously, 
Uh, it's really, yeah. All right. Vincent Valdez and John Keane, thank you both. Thank all of you for coming out, and please help us continue this conversation in the lobby.